I'm talking today to those who are learning to do qualitative research. My focus is on one particular aspect of qualitative research, how to analyze and interpret, make sense of qualitative data. Thus, I'm not going to be talking about general types of qualitative research designs or about methods of collecting qualitative data, like through interviewing or focus groups or observations. Let's imagine for a moment that you've already gotten started and have been conducting and then transcribing oral interviews. And now you're facing a growing pile of interview texts that are all somewhat different, that ramble all over the place, and sometimes include material that doesn't even seem relevant to the topic. You also have a variety of other notes and documents relevant to the research as a whole or to the context in which data were collected. What on earth do you do next? Now what? Where to begin? This is where you sometimes wish you could resort to counting and entering data into a statistics program which will spurt out some tidy findings in a table using efficient, unambiguous symbols and numbers such as chi-squares and regressions to characterize what you found. The very first thing you have to do is to let go of the notion that the findings are sitting out there in that mess of data waiting for you to discover them. You have to forget the idea that there's only one truthful account of what is in your data. It's not that there's no truth, just that there are multiple ways in which you could understand what is there, and you have to learn how to see findings. In this talk, I would like to explain and illustrate what I mean by this, and give you a brief glimpse of what qualitative analysis is like and what it can produce. First, I want to very briefly review a few core theoretical notions about qualitative research. Ideas that you will have heard before in relation to qualitative methodology in general, but which I want to remind you of as they also underlie the principles of qualitative analysis. Second, I will introduce you to a few key principles of qualitative analysis and strategies that can be used in analyzing qualitative data. And finally, I will illustrate some of what I am talking about by walking you through a mini-analysis of some uh, data from my own study. So let me start by reminding you that, the qualita that qualitative analysis uh, that I will be describing is part of a broader form of science that is based on a set of assumptions that are interpretivist as opposed to positivist. These are two different perspectives on the nature of reality and on how we go know it and how we go about knowing it. You are undoubtedly most familiar with what can be called a positivist notion of science. You were probably introduced to this uh, process in grade school with your first science fair, testing hypotheses, controlled experimentation, eliminating bias, and so on. A positivist view of science basically asserts that there's a reality out there independent of our ability to see it or know it. And this reality can be discovered through objective scientific process. From a positivist perspective, both the physical and the social world are seen as rule-governed, regular, predictable systems. The rules can be discovered through experimentation or observation. But there are some, including myself, who would argue that human, social, and psychological phenomena cannot be explained or studied in the same way as can rocks or chemicals or bacteria. The main reason for this is that humans act very much based on how they understand the world. And this understanding is hugely dependent on the context in which humans perceive the world and is not reducible to invariant laws. To understand human behavior and the social groups and organizations and institutions that humans create and are shaped by, an interpretivist perspective is needed. A perspective that proposes that reality is always interpreted by people and that it is the meanings that people assign to reality that plays a key role in human action. Uh, the interpretivist perspective, however, people's conceptions of the world outside of them is not just as a mirror, more or less correct, of some external reality. What they apprehend is filtered and interpreted through human consciousness. Objects or relationships are imbued with symbolic meaning, and this meaning is mediated or shaped by their past experiences, their cultural context, their gender, their age, the historical moment, the organizational setting. In other words, meaning is what we call socially constructed. So to understand human behavior or human institutions, for example, we need to understand how humans see the world, what meanings they attach to things where these meanings come from, how these meanings affect what they think, say, or do. A positivist perspective tends to objectify the issue of meaning, assuming it is a property of the external reality out there, that it resides in the objects themselves. 
An interpretivist approach assumes that reality is always interpreted in particular contexts and that meaning cannot be read off the object itself. It is important here to distinguish between qualitative data and qualitative analysis. Lots of researchers use qualitative data, but not all also do qualitative or interpretive analysis of these data. Thus, you can find what I've called type 1 and type 2 qualitative research. Both types of qualitative research use qualitative data, i.e. data that has not been converted into numbers. But type 1 then takes a positivist approach to analyzing the data, while type 2 takes an interpretive approach. In type 1, researchers typically use qualitative data, say, interview transcripts, but they analyze these data in a quantitative or positivist way. They do content analyses, noting the frequencies of certain words or reported events. They treat what people think or feel as objects that people possess, like attitudes or emotions or perceptions, which are seen as relatively objective attributes of individuals, things that people have or hold in their minds. They restrict the analysis to things that are readily observable, to what people actually say, for example. What people say, the words they use, are taken more or less at face value, as having meanings that are relatively fixed that can be determined objectively by, say, having multiple observers agree on what the true meaning of spoken data is. There is lots of type 1 qualitative research around, particularly in the health sciences, where positivist science is the dominant mode of understanding phenomena. I am not going to be talking about type 1 today, but if I did, I would argue that it is a rather flawed exercise with limited potential for illuminating the human social condition and human experience, mainly because it does not meet the methodological requirements of either positivist or interpretivist science. But that is for another talk. I am, however, going to give you a peek at what type 2 qualitative research might look like, the kind that uses not just qualitative data, but qualitative analysis. So let's turn to considering some of the key ideas underlying qualitative analysis. Just as there are lots of different types of qualitative research designs and types of data, there are also correspondingly many different ways of doing qualitative analysis. I'm going to talk mainly about how I approach analysis, but be sure to remember that there's no one right way, just a bunch of principles that can be applied in different ways. Let me review some of these principles. First, one needs to recognize that analysis is not a discrete stage. It starts the second you start thinking about your project and runs through your research. It isn't something you do all, all at once, once the data uh, are in and are typed up. As you collect data, you start to reread and re-listen to your data, not just to iron out problems and to reframe the next interview but because you want to start understanding what you are getting, which will inform what you might ask for or listen to or watch out for uh, in gathering subsequent data. Analysis is continuous throughout the research process. A second uh, important principle um, in qualitative research is the issue of meaning and its interpretation. The assumption underlying much research is that people act on the basis of how they see the world, the meaning they attach to things. The idea is, if we can understand how they see the world, what their logic is for reasoning, that will give us insight into what they say and what they do. However, meaning is not such an easy thing to determine. As I said earlier, facts do not just exist out there with inherent meaning that is apprehended universally in the same way. An important uh, access to meaning is through language. Words or symbols are indicators of things, ideas, feelings, worldviews. But the same thing can have many meanings, and meaning is dependent on the context. Consider this. I love you, Denise. What has been said here by the speaker? What do these words mean? If we add but one detail, intonation, we see how the meanings change. The first, I love you, Denise, not that other guy. I love you, Denise. I don't just like you. I love you, Denise, not that other woman. The inflection alone creates vastly different meanings and implications. And this is before you even add in all the other contexts. Who is this exchange between? Where is it happening? What does it concern, etc.? All of which contribute to the interpretation of this sentence. 
The important point here is that meaning of, of those words, that the meaning of those words does not reside in the words themselves. It is relational, constituted by a whole host of contingent contextual circumstances, and always from the standpoint of the person doing the interpreting. This is true for all manner of phenomenon. Take, for example, the meaning of a wink. A student in the class winks. What's the meaning of that eye movement? How could we interpret it? A wink may have conscious intent to the winker. Something is being communicated to another student. A social gesture. You don't wink to yourself. The winker could mean, see, I told you so, referring to something they both acknowledge, like, I told you this class would be boring. But it could also have a different meaning to the receiver of the wink, the winky. This student might see it as a flirtatious gesture and be offended or, or pleased rather than um, it being acknowledgement of a shared ongoing idea. Or another student, not part of the wink exchange, may perceive it as a gesture of exclusion. The wink here means being left out, not belonging. And there is also meaning outside of the immediate participants. The wink also has meaning to the analyst observer. A sociologist like me, for example, might see other significance in the wink. For example, I might see it as a marker of social distinctions. Winks are generally not exchanged between those of unequal social position. So it might be an indicator of social groupings uh, among students. The context isn't just the classroom or immediate circumstance. Winks and facial expressions have very different meaning in different social classes, in different cultural communities, in different historical periods. So when we're talking about meaning, we need to recognize that meaning does not reside in the phenomenon itself. It is always mediated through interpretation. There can be multiple meanings at the same time. There can be intended meanings and latent meanings. Meanings are always contextual. Meanings are generated at the individual cognitive level and at the societal level. But this is not to say that anything goes or that interpreting meaning is an ad hoc business. The challenge of qualitative research is to be able to problematize or critically examine meanings, either what research subjects say or the meaning that we researchers attribute to phenomenon. This is not at all easy because much of meaning is deeply embedded, unconscious, taken for granted, rooted in broad institutional structures. And much of the meaning we are interested in is beyond the articulation, um, is beyond articulation, so cannot be achieved just by asking people to clarify what they mean. And it's very hard to suspend meanings we as researchers bring to things. So if we go back then to our list of key principles, we can add another, that meanings are constantly transformed in the research process. For example, take the matter of transcription. Transforming oral recordings uh, of what people say into written text so that they can be analyzed. Although you might think of transcription as just a straightforward technical procedure, it is a highly transformative process that loses and adds critical detail needed for adequate interpretation. Think what is lost when you no longer can see the person being interviewed and the physical environment. When the emphasis, tone, pauses, hand and facial gestures pace, volume, and so on, are all stripped from the original happening. Yes, there are some ways of getting that into the transcribed version, and you do see very fancy methods of semiotic transcription that records the length of the pauses and so on. But a ton is lost, which is particularly problematic if you yourself didn't do the original data collection. And there is also the problem of what happened during transcription. People often farm out the transcription to typists with scarcely a thought, giving them no guidance as to what you want preserved. Typists thus often work hard to clean up the data for you, eliminating bad grammar, making meanings clearer, and so on, and you are left with a sterile page of typed words drained of the very things needed to do qualitative interpretation. Another key principle is that there are standardized procedures, for, that there are no standardized procedures for doing qualitative analysis. I don't like to portray what one actually does in the course of analyzing data as procedures because this term evokes too much conventional scientific expectation that if you get the procedure right, that the results will be right. In qualitative analysis, there is no one correct way to analyze. 
like there are correct statistical procedures for particular situations. There is no necessary relationship between a certain procedure and a certain analytic outcome. Like, if you do X, you will get a known analytic product Y. Another key principle is that, is, um, that in qualitative research, the researcher is the key instrument of analysis. In qualitative analysis, the researcher, not the procedure, drives the analysis. Ultimately, the interpretation given to the data and the shape of the final analytic interpretation is a creation of the researcher, grounded in data, but conceived and framed by the researcher's knowledge and theoretical perspective. Since the researcher's head is the productive force in qualitative analysis, it follows that computer software also cannot do the analysis for you. It can help you manage data to facilitate analytic insight, but it cannot itself interpret data and produce findings. Um, <clears throat> uh, another principle is that there, are, there, aren't, there isn't just one interpretation. Uh, there can be multiple accounts of what is going on. The truth of what is being studied is not out there waiting, awaiting the researcher to make sense of it, to discover it. There are multiple senses that could be made of any phenomenon. It is not irrelevant what is out there, however. Qualitative research isn't just manufactured in the researcher's imagination. This is research, not fiction. So also, there are more than one valid interpretation that can be made of a set of phenomena. Not all interpretations are equal. They can be more or less convincing and trustworthy, depending on how they are grounded in the data and in relation to other knowledge and theory.